I've been a Stephen King fan since I was in fifth grade. Um, I'm a fanatic, in fact. So when I found out that he was going to be publishing a sequel to The Shining, I, like everybody else who's a King fan, lost my mind. I always wondered what happened to Danny when he grew up. People ask me sometimes, and I would joke and say, well, he married Charlie McGee from Firestarter, and I had these amazing superhero kids. Yeah. What's up, Doc? What's the bit? One of the things that I wanted to see was a man at the end of his rope, a man for whom the alcohol wasn't working anymore. And what's her name again, cutie? Dan. Dan. He'd reached this point of hitting a bottom, total desperation. You're gonna take I look at The Shining and Dr. Sleep as incredibly personal stories for King, um, who dealt with his own alcoholism. And it's very easy to see when you read The Shining that this is about a man who's terrified of what he could do to his family if he doesn't deal with this particular problem. And Dr. Sleep is written by a man who's recovered and who has embraced sobriety and found support in that. Here we go. Really, it's about acceptance, courage, and wisdom. You can cut everything else out. I was a practicing drunk when I wrote The Shining. I'm functional, but practicing. And when I wrote Dr. Sleep, uh, I'd been sober for a long time, and I wanted to write Dan's story from that perspective because I was considerably different in a different place from the guy who wrote The Shining. And that was uh, one of the impelling forces behind writing the book. I felt like I had a more of a global view of that particular character. I'm thinking about my dad. He died when I was five. This is for Jack Torrance. As a fan, I felt for a very long time there were two visions of The Shining that seemed to be in competition within the minds and hearts of a lot of fans. The Stephen King Shining and there was the Kubrick Shining. The two were very different things. I always felt that Kubrick's movie was chilly, uh, as chilly as the uh, snow that surrounds the Overlook Hotel. There's a feeling of beauty that's in a snow globe. His movie ended in ice, and my book ended in fire. One of the things that's been the biggest honor for me is to try to pull those worlds together. I saw it as an opportunity as well to go back and try to resurrect some of the things about the novel that had been changed in Kubrick's adaptation that I thought we could recover. Mike has worked in a universe where some of the things that happened in the movie didn't happen in my book, and somehow has been able to make it work. In my book, Dick Halloran Lives, Kubrick's movie, Halloran Dies, and what Mike did was to bring him back as a ghost, which makes perfect sense in the context of the story. And we got to keep the scenes as they were in the book. The only difference was at the end of the scene, there'd be one cut where you couldn't see him anymore. Hey! The biggest change that we made was to the third act, which in the novel takes place on the campground that used to be the site of the Overlook Hotel. And so the pitch was, let's keep the hotel uh, alive so that we can stage that final battle in the Overlook itself. And the trade-off is, you know, we're changing the ending of Doctor Sleep, but we're changing it to be the ending of The Shining that King never got to see made. Mike's movie does two things. It's a fine adaptation of Dr. Sleep, but it's also a terrific sequel to Stanley Kubrick's movie, The Shining. It could have been baggage, but instead it's a dividend. It enriches, and I don't know about anybody else how anybody's gonna feel about it, but for me, it was great to go back to the Overlook. It was great to go back.